Good morning. Good morning. Please rise, either in body or in spirit, and join me in a call to worship. And we will be responsible. Come, Holy Spirit, ignite our hearts with joy. For God has done wondrous things for us. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us with the power of the rushing wind. For Christ has called each of us and has blessed us. Come, Holy Spirit, be with us today. Be with us today. Help us to boldly proclaim the risen Christ. May our worship begin. Please remain standing and join your voices in the first hymn. Sweet, sweet spirit, found on page 391 in your hymn. Spirit and began to speak in other languages 
as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When they heard this sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native language. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all the people who are speaking Galileans? Every one of them. How then can each of us hear from speaking in our native language? They were all surprised and bewildered. Some asked each other, What does this mean? Others jeered at them, saying, They're full of new wine. Peter stood with the other eleven apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this, listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk, as you suspect. After all, it is only nine o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your going, your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders to occur in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be changed into darkness, and the moon will be changed into blood. Before the great and spectacular day of the Lord comes. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, let us sing one verse of Jesus loves me as we have the time for children and youth.
that they should use this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit to let His love shine to all the world and that it would give them power and comfort and all of these wonderful things. So just like this flashlight needs these batteries, we need the Holy Spirit in us to let Jesus' love shine to everyone around us by helping them and by doing all these wonderful things for people. We can let them know that the Holy Spirit is inside of us. Okay? Let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let your love shine from us. Um, Okay, thank you for that message, John. The Holy Spirit is our battery. And all we want is something new. John is uh, presenting for the children on Sunday morning. Um, one thing I didn't mention uh, yesterday, uh, my family got together. You know, it's a holiday weekend uh, this weekend. And as a part of the festivities of my family getting together, um, we had to celebrate not one, not two, but three birthdays. Um, none of them were actually yesterday. I have a son-in-law, his birthday is May 24th, uh, and my son's birthday is June 1st, and one of my grandson's birthdays is June 3rd. Well, of course, Joey and I are going to be leaving, and this is our last time we're getting together with family, so we had to celebrate birthdays uh, on that uh, occasion yesterday. Now, this was not the same as Anne's birthday party uh, that she had a while back in April, uh, but it was a good time gathered together. We did have the traditional birthday cake, and if it's a birthday, what do you have to have on the cake? Candles. Candles. So, each one of the guys got a cake with their candle stuck in front of them. And, you know, it was a picture opportunity, and they all had to blow out the candles at exactly the same time, whatever. And the cake itself actually, um, okay, so there were three guys that had birthdays. Uh, my son-in-law, my first son-in-law, the, the in-law that's been in our family the longest, my own son, my only son, and my oldest grandson were the three guys that were celebrating the birthday. Can you guess which one of those my wife allowed to choose the kind of cake and ice cream that we were going to have? Grandson. The grandson, of course. Uh, so we had, fortunately, because he has tremendous taste, we had chocolate cake and chocolate ice cream and vanilla ice cream to go along uh, with that. So it was a wonderful celebration, but of course, um, and of course the grandson, he got to open his present and look at it and whatever, and it was, he was all excited about it, and I was outside at the time, and he came running outside, showed me what he had, and whatever. But my uh, son and son-in-law, they were getting ready to leave, and my wife thought, oh my gosh, I've got to give them the presents. So, you know, she had to give them the presents real quick, and I think they probably appreciated them as well. Uh, but... Uh, you know, what would a birthday party be without cake and ice cream, uh, without presents, right? Uh, so, uh, what um, Richard read to us this morning from the book of Acts was talking about the very first time that the Holy Spirit came down and uh, was evident in the lives of the disciples, and we call that the beginning or the birthday of the church. And so today, I want to talk about the gifts. The gifts that were received on that very first birthday of the church, if you will, and the gifts that hopefully we continue to receive uh, even today. And of course, the great gift of that first Pentecost was the Holy Spirit. So we're going to be talking about birthday gifts, but specifically about the gifts 
of the Holy Spirit this morning. Shall we pray? Gracious God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts and minds be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I oftentimes wonder a lot about the disciples when you're reading through the gospel stories. And you, you've got to consider, you're trying, you're trying to look at things through their, their perspective, through their life, because they were the initial ones to be around Jesus and to learn for the very first hand from Him all those things that we as Christians should be doing and feeling and the ways that we should be acting. So, when I hear this story from Acts, I sort of wonder, how were the disciples feeling on that first Pentecost uh, morning? They were all gathered together in one place. Actually, they were gathered in Jerusalem for a Jewish festival. Remember, they were all born and raised as Jews, all of the disciples. And so they were gathered together in Jerusalem for a festival that was already called Pentecost. It was already known as Pentecost. Um, and it is known as that because it's 50 days, the Pente, if you're wondering about that. It's 50 days after Passover. Uh, Passover, actually, that particular year, uh, coincided with Easter Sunday. Um, so it was 50 days also after Easter that this took place. So Christians sort of took the even the name of this Jewish holiday and claimed it as their own. Uh, Pentecost. Uh, 50 days after uh, the resurrection. But originally it was a Jewish festival, and it still is actually a Jewish festival, sometimes called the Festival of Booths instead of uh, Pentecost. But they also use the term Pentecost. Uh, Jews still use the term Pentecost for the 50th day after Passover. It doesn't always fall exactly um, on the same time as our Pentecost, but, but very close uh, to that. But so these disciples, these men, uh, were gathered together to share in a festival that was very comfortable to them. Something that they were familiar with. Something that they had grown up with all of their lives being good uh, Jewish scholars uh, and Jewish men themselves. They were very, very familiar with this particular festival. So that's why they all gathered together in Jerusalem at this particular time on that first Pentecost Sunday. But just think about, I'd like to think about, well, all the things that they've experienced in the last couple of months. You know, think of how their lives have changed. The things that have happened to them. You know, they were there uh, uh, just about two months ago when Jesus entered into to Jerusalem to a hero's welcome. There was a huge palm parade that they provided for Jesus when He came in to the city of Jerusalem. Probably about the last time most of these disciples had been in Jerusalem was that final week that we refer to as Holy Week. And it started with that Palm Sunday when there was that huge parade and Jesus came in on the back of a donkey and everyone was acclaiming Him as the Messiah, as a hero. And then during that week, there was the scene where Jesus turns the tables over in the temple and gets so angry that He drives the money changers out of the temple. Um, and then we know that He was arrested and falsely tried. The people who were cheering Him just a few days before now are calling for His crucifixion. And then, of course, we know about how He suffered and eventually was crucified and died on that cross um, on that Friday, an agonizing death. And while all that was going on, him being arrested and, and being tortured, the disciples ran away. They hid. Peter even denied that he even knew Christ. Um, and they were hiding away in fear for their lives. Uh, then, of course, they came face to face with Jesus again. 
in that upper room uh, when he appeared to them after his resurrection and then he appeared again a week later and the various had contact with Jesus for the next six weeks or so. You know, different things that must have been going through their heads, what they were thinking, how they were feeling uh, at that time. And then Jesus, of course, ascends into heaven. He's no longer physically present with them. I can just imagine that they are probably just totally confused. You know, what's going to happen next? You know, it's unbelievable the events that have occurred up until this time. So finally, they kind of settle back into somewhat of a routine for them in their lives. They're going to meet together in Jerusalem for this festival of booths, a harvest festival uh, that was known as Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost is first recorded back, way back in Deuteronomy, in the 16th chapter of Deuteronomy, and it was a celebration of the harvest that was to take place 50 days after Passover. Um, and I'm sure the disciples were thinking, finally, here's something we can relax about. Here's a day where we can gather together and celebrate God, and everyone will be celebrating God. And, uh, they were ready to sort of meet with God on this particular festival day, just as they had always done. So finally, they're thinking some normal AT is going to return to their lives in some way. But of course, it did not. Because what unfolds during this day is one of the most bizarre stories we have in all the Gospels. I mean, this is a really bizarre story if you think about it. They're gathered together here in, in a house, some kind of dwelling, and there's a huge, loud wind like a hurricane. If you've ever been close to a tornado or a hurricane and heard the noise, the sound that it makes, you know, it can be heard for miles and miles away. So there's this huge rushing wind that comes in and makes this huge noise and everybody around town must be able to hear it because they're coming to investigate. Hey, what was that? What's going on? So all the people that were there in Jerusalem for this big Jewish festival now are coming into where the disciples are because they want to investigate what was that noise. They, they're not familiar with tornadoes in the Middle East, but, you know, huge um, winds of different kinds, you know, this was very unusual for them. So they're, they're going to investigate. And of course, when the wind blew through, the Holy Spirit came upon the men, the disciples, uh, like fire descending upon their heads. We don't know how many people saw that, if it was only the disciples that actually saw that manifestation of the Holy Spirit, or if other people saw it as well. But we do know, we hear in the story, that all of a sudden, all 12 of these men began speaking in languages that were unknown to them. But evidently they were making sense in those languages because all those other people that were gathering around could hear parts of the gospel message being told to them in their own tongue so that they could understand it. And of course, that's very confusing for the rest of the people that are there, for all the uh, people that are gathered around. Aren't these all guys from Galilee? Galilee? You know, they're Galilean. How do they know all these different languages? Why are they, why are they speaking in all these different tongues uh, at this time? And some people said, well, they must be drunk. Now, i got to wonder about that statement. Um, Usually, if you get drunk, you speak in a foreign language that you don't know. Uh, no, I, I sort of disregard that. Uh, but Peter throws it off, too. He said, what are you talking about? It's 9 o'clock in the morning. You know, what are we having been drinking? Yeah, uh, we'll get there because it was a festival day. But uh, we haven't been drinking yet. So, no, I, I couldn't be that. You know? And so people were wondering. They're going, what is going on here? Um... And the disciples, did they really know that they had been gifted with the gift of the Holy Spirit? Jesus had told them that the Holy Spirit was going to come to them and they, you know, in power. They were going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Did they really understand at that very moment that that's what was happening to them? I don't really know if they understood at that moment. But Peter did go back and referenced... Uh, 
uh, a prophecy from Joel long before that would help explain that and say, hey, this must be God's Spirit coming upon us so that we can uh, proclaim the Gospel to you in many tongues. This is a miracle of God. This is one of the one of the most bizarre stories <laughs> that we can find in the Gospel. I mean, of course, you know, you have a baby born to a virgin that's sort of a little bit unusual. We have a man uh, you know, Jesus comes back from the dead. I guess you could call those a uh, little unusual stories too. But this one, this one is very unusual as well. Um, and uh, uh, it's the Holy Spirit appearing for that very first time. Did those disciples really realize what this gift of the Holy Spirit meant for them? And more importantly, I think, do we really realize what the gift of the Holy Spirit means for us today? So, in three quick ways, your sister's not here, so I can say quick. In three quick ways, I'm going to tell you uh, what I think of, you know, some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, are. I'm just going to mention three of them and explain them very quickly uh, for us. First, I want to start with the gift of the Holy Spirit to the disciples and to us is the gift of excitement. Some theologians believe that God gave the gift of the Holy Spirit to energize the church from the very beginning. The Holy Spirit is here to energize the church and to make the church an exciting place to be. Now, let's be honest. We don't really come to church for excitement, uh, do we? It's, it's not the most exciting place to be, perhaps, uh, even on Sunday mornings. Um, and, you know, I understand that. I mean, I'm, I'm up here all the time looking out that way, and I see some of you, and it looks good. <laughs> it hard, you know, blinking very hard and trying to, to keep awake. Or Jacob with his big yawns down here. At least you're awake when you're yawning. So, uh, you know, few of us come here on Sunday morning for the thrill of the service. Would you agree with that? Few of us are here for the thrill, for the excitement of it. Um, and yet, it seems to me that some Christians and some churches treat the Holy Spirit as if the gift of it, it, it is the gift to make the church an exciting, entertaining place to be on Sunday morning. I actually grew up in a church sort of like that, in a Assembly of God church, and every Sunday morning. There were people jumping up and speaking in tongues, and quite often there were people that would run around the church in the spirit. They would actually run in the spirit. You never knew when somebody's going to jump up out of the pew and run around the church, uh, usually with their hands up, shouting. You know. Um, okay, well that was pretty exciting for a seven and eight year old kid. You know, to see that you sort of wonder. You know, uh, I don't. I wonder if the adults maybe at that time playing some bets. You know, who's going to be next? <laughs> I don't know. That some of them might have done that. I don't, I don't really know. But um, that's, that's, there, there, is, there is some truth in the fact that the Holy Spirit comes to excite us, to energize us. Um, it is the Holy Spirit who inspires us and should be stirring us up for action. It should be stirring us up for mission, if you will. Um, but the Holy Spirit is not a gift from God to make the church a place of entertainment, uh, a place of excitement in the sense that we should come here to be entertained on Sunday mornings. That's not why we're here. Um, instead, the energy and the excitement of the Holy Spirit brings, it, it, that's for a different purpose. It, it's, to, it, it's to energize us for mission, to continue to excite us to do those things that Christ calls us to do. And that's the power of the energy of the Holy Spirit. And I, I think to see that, we need to look quickly at both sides of this Pentecost story uh, to grasp sort of its context here. Immediately before the story of the Pentecost in Acts 1, if you begin reading Acts with Acts 1, it's the story of choosing Matthias. 
um, as the, the new 12th disciple uh, to replace Judas, of course, uh, who has betrayed Jesus and now has committed suicide and is no longer around, so they, they want to replace him. So they go through this in Acts 1, talking about um, choosing Matthias. Matthi Matthi and given the fact that the disciples had very much committed that decision to prayer, and it was a difficult decision for them, well, we're confident that the Holy Spirit was in that decision-making process for the disciples. So the Holy Spirit really was already there, working through those early disciples as they were preparing to organize the early church, if you will. To organize their first missions out to the people. One of the first things they did was to choose Matthias uh, to be the 12th disciple. Um, and so they were organizing themselves. They were getting ready to go out in mission to the world. And so we know the Holy Spirit was a part of that particular process. Immediately after this particular story, if you read on in Acts 2, we have the story of how the early church conducted itself. So the disciples preparing to establish the early church before this, and then immediately after this, we have how the early church conducted itself as an institution, uh, if you will. Um, community living, developing communal ideas, joining together in worship and daily prayer. That's how they began to organize the early church. And given the fact that this comes immediately after Pentecost, we're confident that the Holy Spirit was there in helping them form this beginning church. So it seems to me that the gift of the Holy Spirit to energize and, and to excite is directly related to how we organize church and how we do mission as God's people. That's what we're energized for. That's what we're excited about. At least that's what we should be excited about. So you don't have to be excited here on Sunday morning uh, as we worship, as we think, as we praise God, as we pray together. But we do need to be excited about God's mission for us in this world. That's when we need the energy. That's when we need the effort. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort for you to sit there and feel on Sunday morning, does it? Uh, but if you're working in the food pantry, if you're filling the blessing box, if you're working in vacation Bible school, that takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of excitement to do those things. And that's where uh, the Holy Spirit provides that energy and excitement for us. So the Holy Spirit does excite, energize us. Not so that we can be entertained on Sunday mornings, but so that we can be a mission-oriented church, a, a fellowship of believers, a community uh, that will be lively, and our mission activity hopefully will be meaningful and transformative. Not just for those it touches, but for us as well. Second, the gift of the Holy Spirit is a gift of power. Many believe that the main gift of the Holy Spirit is a gift of power. Jesus promised that. He said that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power. But there is appropriate and inappropriate power when it comes to the church. When we come to think about the church itself. There was a time, of course, when the church, the Christian church, if you will, it was known as the Universal Church or the Catholic Church, uh, there was a time when the church was one of the most powerful institutions in society. First in Roman society, when the Roman Emperor Constantine declared Christianity to be the, the religion of the land. It was a very powerful institution uh, in Roman society. In European feudal society, Christianity was a very important and powerful constitution. Uh, uh, part of uh, society as well. Uh, and then even in early American society, Christianity was a driving force for the creation of, of the United States of America. Uh, it was a driving force and a very influential and powerful force in this country for many, many years. But of course we can't say that it holds that kind of sway 
anymore in the 21st century here in the USA. And some people may lament the passing of those times when the church was such a powerful institution. But we must also recognize the abuses of that power that even the church itself got involved in throughout history in many different ways. When the church gets involved too much in political and economic power, there are abuses that creep into the institution of the church as well, as we have seen all too well unfold in the 20th and the 21st uh, century. Um, I think it is inappropriate for the church to demand power just because it's the church. That's not what it was designed for. That's not what we read about and understand from the Gospel. But Christ did promise that the Holy Spirit would confer power on the church. But not that kind of economic power. Not that kind of political power that we typically associate with power. The power the church has is power that is born out of brokenness. It's born out of brokenness, not out of strength. The power that the church has is a prophetic influence, not a dictatorial role to tell everybody what they should do and how they should do it. But it's a prophetic influence. It's try to, to convince people of the right way to live and the right things to do. And of course, the way to follow Christ. The history of the early church and early church power was only radically changed after the Roman Emperor Constantine in the 4th century uh, declared the church to be the church of the state and the only church of the state. Wow. I think it's appropriate in the Holy Spirit for us to seek power, but not that kind of power. Not the power of domination. Not the power of overt influence. But the power of prophetic weakness. Prophetic weakness born out of brokenness, realizing that we're all broken people. That we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But, but, there are greater days ahead. And we can look ahead and the closer that we can align ourselves with God and with God's ways, the greater this life is going to be. That's the power the church should have to instill that kind of vision among all God's people here on this earth. So the Holy Spirit is the gift of energy and excitement and the Holy Spirit is the gift of power. But crucially, and I think most importantly of all, and the third one I'm going to mention is the Holy Spirit is the gift of the Word. The gift of the Word. The Holy Spirit is the gift of the message to proclaim. One of the central images of the Pentecost event, of course, as we've heard from our reading, is the fact that the silence was broken and the believers began speaking again in different tongues. So those who were there heard the gospel message in a way that they could understand that made sense to them. They could hear it and understand it for themselves so that they could make a decision for themselves and not somebody else making the decision for them, but so that they could make the decision when they heard it in their own tongue. And it was the Holy Spirit who gave the, this beginning of the church the words to say. It was the Holy Spirit who actually put the word of the gospel in the mouths of the disciples so that everyone could hear and understand it. And as Peter explained this phenomenon to the people there, he drew their attention to the prophecy of Joel in the Old Testament. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. My friends, the church, we have a message. It's the good news as proclaimed in the gospel. And at the end of this service, here in just a couple of minutes, we're going to sing, we have a story to tell to the nations. And that command 
to go and tell others the good news of Jesus Christ is not something that we do in our own strength, but with the power and the strength and the excitement of the Holy Spirit within us. The Holy Spirit will give us the words to say. The gift of the Holy Spirit is ultimately a gift not just to the church, but to the entire world. Because the church itself is energized and excited for mission, and, and, and the church itself has power so that we can share our brokenness with all others and, and encourage others to great days that lie ahead, and so that we can tell the story. We can tell the gospel story, the message that we have been given over and over again. Because, my friends, we're given a voice. And we're given that message to proclaim so that the whole world will hear it. And then it's up to them to receive this good news of Jesus Christ. So, my friends, to conclude here at First Presbyterian Church, my prayer is that we will be a church that uses these gifts of the Holy Spirit. A church that's energized to do the gospel through our mission work. A church that's empowered, that has a prophetic word to bring to the world. And these are the gifts of Pentecost that we celebrate today with red and with balloons. We celebrate this birthday today. It's the spirit that we're called to embrace in all of our activities in our lives as Christians. It's the spirit of energy. It's the spirit of power. It's the spirit of prophecy. The Holy Spirit of God. It's our gift. It's your gift to accept right now in this Pentecost today of 2023. We want to feel the power of the Holy Spirit among us, and so we open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit to come in. We ask the Holy Spirit to bless us, all of us here at First Presbyterian, so that we can be a blessing to this whole community and to everywhere that our mission power may touch. So thanks be to God for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of response this morning is Spirit of God Descend Upon My Heart. It's found on page 390 in your hymnal. We're going to see the first, third, and fourth verses. So let's follow Jacob and all rise, either in body or in spirit, and sing the first, third, and fourth verses of three.
here may be seated. And please you with me now in that affirmation of faith, the Apostle Creed, which you find printed in your bold this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Encouragement for the discouraged, 
We pray for comfort for those who are sorrowing and sad. We pray for healing for those with sickness and other problems. And we want to give thanks for your loving presence in the lives of all those in need, especially those that we named the beginning of this service this day. And we thank you for your presence in our own lives. We thank you for this church. We thank you for those who, who led us to this congregation. We ask that you continue to give them and to give each of us wisdom and courage to take the words of your gospel message out to all that we need. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit who empowers and excites us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, our closing hymn this morning, of course, has to be We Restore to Tell to the Nations. We're going to sing the entire uh, four verses of this particular closing hymn. I would ask uh, that you now stand one last time, either in body or in spirit, as we sing the hymn number four. four
If you're worried that you don't know the story to tell, go back there and read the words of that man. It gives you the story right there. In brief, the story to tell to the nation. And that's what we're called to do. That's who we're called to be as Christians. With the power of the Holy Spirit to go out and to tell that story to the rest of the nation. So I hope you do that on this beautiful day uh, tomorrow and on the holiday uh, that we're having and all this week. I hope you have a great week. I hope you have a great next few weeks because I won't see you again here at this place anyway uh, until June 24th. It seems like a long way off, doesn't it? Um, and it'll be here before you know it. I'll be back up here uh, taking your Sunday morning away. Uh, again. So I hope you have a great few weeks. I, I hope that uh, life treats you well. And I know it will because I know that God is always with you. Because God is always above us, watching over us. God is always below us, supporting us. God is always behind us protect us. God always goes before us to guide us. God always stands right beside us to give us a shoulder to lean on. And most importantly of all, God is always inside of us to bring us peace and joy. So go enjoy this day, my friends. Amen.